In this lesson, we're going to take a little walk through history to look at how uh, we developed different ideas about matter. And I guess the, the simplest way that we learned about uh, how, how matter worked was food chemistry. Um, cooking is indeed a form of chemistry, adding heat to, uh, to food uh, changes its chemical composition. And so we learned, I guess, a long, long time ago that cooking food changes its chemical properties. And we learned many techniques to preserve food, to stop it from rotting and uh, keep it for a long time, such as uh, heating and freezing food, um, salting and drying food and hanging them up to dry, or fermentation as a way to preserve food. For example, we have uh, preserving fruit to make jams and jellies, uh, drying, uh, drying fish and other meats. Um, we have sauerkraut, which is a way to preserve cabbage. And of course, we do an awful lot of pickling of preserves to keep uh, food for a long, long time. Now, later, uh, we also developed uh, metallurgy. We began working with uh, different kinds of metals. And some of the early metals that we knew of were gold and silver, copper, lead, and iron and we were getting quite familiar with these and we learned to make them how into uh, jewelry tools weapons etc some of the processes that we used one was called annealing and what this means is heating up the metal and then hammering it into shape so it wasn't so brittle so this is essentially what uh, what blacksmiths do uh, we also learned to mix metals together and create what are called alloys alloys are mixtures of metal that had many desirable qualities to them so, for example, we learned how to make bronze out of a mixture of copper and tin, brass uh, from a mixture of copper and zinc, uh, pewter from tin with a little bit of copper added to it, and, of course, steel, very, very strong substance made with iron mixed with carbon. We also had ideas of what was matter actually made up of. And let's go back to the ancient Greeks here. We have, for example, Aristotle, seen here, and he thought that matter had only four elements. And maybe you've heard of these. They were earth, air, fire, and water. And so Aristotle thought that things were either made of one of these elements or perhaps some combination of the four mixed together. About the same time, a different fellow, uh, Democritus here, he felt that matter was composed of tiny little particles that he called atomos. Now, there you go. You can probably recognize in there, that's where we got the word atom from. Uh, he, of course, couldn't see them. He was just sort of philosophizing that these things existed. He had no way to really verify this. In the Middle Ages, we had the, uh, the growth of alchemy. Uh, sort of like partial science, uh, kind of magic. Alchemists were convinced that they could turn base metals like, like lead and iron into valuable gold if they could only find or create uh, what Aristotle proposed as being the missing fifth element, or also known as the quintessential. Of course, it was an epic fail. It never did work. But uh, along the way, with all their sort of horsing around and, and experiments and trials and errors that they did, uh, they certainly learned an awful lot about many different kinds of chemicals although we really couldn't call this a science at this stage. Uh, to protect their secrets, these alchemists had all kinds of strange and bizarre symbols to, uh, to name their compounds so that no one could sort of spy on, uh, on what they were doing or trying to build. Um, they never were successful, of course, in, in producing their, uh, their, their transmutation of base metals into gold. Now, later in the Renaissance, we have this fellow, Antoine Lavoisier, a Frenchman here, uh, many people consider him to be the father of modern chemistry, and so that's why he gets mentioned right now. He actually performed quantitative experiments. Now, that is to say he measured his materials. He didn't just fling them together. He actually did very, very careful measurements. Uh, did some pretty interesting things. Uh, he discovered oxygen in 1778, and he later on discovered hydrogen gas in 1783. He disproved the phlogiston theory, and that theory was that uh, uh, substances burned because they contained a magical invisible fluid called phlogiston, and that's why some things burned. He basically proved that that was nonsense. And he was also very responsible for helping uh, develop the metric system that we use today. He proved that sulfur was an element, not a compound. He also discovered that although matter may change in its form from solids to liquids to gases during a chemical reaction, here's the big thing. He discovered that the mass didn't change. So he did very careful quantitative measurements, and he discovered that before and after a chemical reaction, the mass didn't change. And so that leads us to this very important part of chemistry. This is very, very foundation 
foundational, and that is the law of conservation of mass, that the mass does not change before and after a chemical reaction. Uh, nothing is created, nothing is destroyed, they just get rearranged with different partnerships, you might say. As we carry on through history, we have uh, other players who come in here. John Dalton was a big one. Dalton thought that atoms were like small spheres, kind of like a, like a little marble. Each one had its own special properties. And in his model, he had basically five uh, ideas. Uh, number one, that elements are made of extremely small particles called atoms. So that kind of goes back to the ancient Greeks and Democritus. Uh, atoms of a given element are identical in size, mass, and other properties. So for example, if you're an atom of gold, then you're exactly identical to any atom of gold found anywhere in the universe. Number three, atoms cannot be subdivided, created, nor destroyed. So they're the smallest unit that you can possibly have of matter. Number four, atoms of different elements combine in simple whole number ratios to form chemical compounds. And this was pretty important because he realized now what compounds are actually made of. They're made of combinations of atoms that come together in certain ratios. So for example, in water, which is H2O, he would say that the ratio is two hydrogens to every one atom of oxygen. And number five, in chemical reactions, atoms are combined, separated, or rearranged. So there's all kinds of interesting rearrangements going around here. And he had a number of interesting uh, symbols that he used for his, uh, his atoms, so drawn like little, little spheres or circles on his notes. Now later on, J.J. Thompson uh, worked with beams of particles in a vacuum tube, and you can actually see his uh, strange looking vacuum tube apparatus here. He discovered that these beams were negatively charged, and he wanted to figure out what were these negative charges and where were they were where they were coming from. Well, what he basically discovered was, this is the guy who discovered the electron's existence. And so he took Dalton's uh, model of the atom, and he wanted to refine it. He said, yeah, it's, it's kind of like a sphere, like uh, Dalton said, but it has embedded in it. It has these, uh, these negative electrons, these little green things here who are negative, embedded inside of the atom. And the atom is basically a positively charged cloud with these electrons uh, embedded in it. And the name that he gave this thing, they said it kind of looks like a plum pudding. And so he proposed what's called the plum pudding model of, of atoms. Ernest Rutherford, as you see here, studied in McGill University in Montreal. What he did was he aimed a positively charged alpha particle at a piece of tin foil. And you can see his experiment over here. Um, what happened that kind of surprised him is that some of the particles went straight through, uh, some were deflected or bent, and some bounced right back. And so what he discovered, basically as seen in the second diagram, he discovered that inside the atom there is this really heavy, dense nucleus, and it can cause deflections of particles. It can even cause some to, to bounce right back. And so Rutherford is created, uh, credited with uh, basically coming up with this idea of the electron, and this is starting to look kind of familiar with what we sort of know today, that at the center of the uh, atom, there is a, a nucleus made of positive and negative charges called protons and neutrons, and that running around them in orbits are these negatively charged electrons. Niels Bohr uh, did this uh, one step better. He actually demonstrated that the electron orbit the nucleus in, in very, very specific energy levels and that when an electron falls from a higher level to a lower energy level, it reduces, re releases a particular color of light. This forms an emission spectrum that is unique to every element. You can think of this as being kind of like the fingerprint. So what's going on here is, if you look at this diagram of the atom here, when an electron falls, for example, from one level to another level, it emits light at a certain color. This here is called an absorption spectrum. And, and they and elements do this, each element does this at a particular, in its own particular fashion. It's extremely unique. No two elements have exactly the same emission spectrum. It literally is kind of like their, their uh, fingerprint, if you will. Uh, and so what Niels Bohr proved is the electrons don't just orbit uh, randomly around the nucleus. They have very, very definite layers or levels that they run around in. This got refined even further by the quantum mechanical model of the atom, and this is sort of where we are today. 
where these electron levels are actually thought to exist in the form of a cloud. Now, of course, remember, we, we can't actually see these things. So this is done through theorization and experimentation. Uh, and so they form a cloud of negative charges around an atom's nucleus. Electrons occupy this cloud with a mathematical probability. In other words, you can calculate statistically what are the odds of an electron being in that particular uh, orbit. We still have a nucleus that's made of proton, which is the positive charges, and neutrons, which are neutral or have no, no charges. Other subatomic particles have also been discovered, but we don't need to worry about those just yet in, uh, in Science 10. To sort of understand the probability, we see, for example, a, a quantum model of an atom here, and we see these different orbitals shown as these colored clouds. Uh, for example, you can see names like the 1s orbital, uh, the 2s orbital, uh, the 2p orbital. This is kind of getting beyond science 10, but just so that you know, these are sort of like the cloud areas that these electrons occupy. What's the probability of an electron being there? Well, it's kind of like, uh, like looking at the spinning propeller on an airplane. You know, what's the probability, if you stuck your finger into that thing, that you'd get it chopped off? Well, the answer is probably pretty good. And that gives you some idea of how incredibly fast these electrons actually move in these, uh, in these orbital clouds.